So if they want to, they can come, they can come back. All right, so this is course P2020 construction materials. There are three parts to this course. Actually, this course used to be a total three credit course. Uh, the first part was concrete technology. The second part was mess, uh, sorry steel. The third part was, part was masonry. And the fourth part was composites. Then later on, it was split into two parts. The first part is a separate course that is called uh, concrete technology. I think you have not taken that course yet. You will be taking that course next semester, I suppose. And uh, the second, third, and fourth part parts, they are joined together to make this construction materials course. The first sub part of this one was steel. The second sub part is masonry. And the third one would be composites. OK, so masonry, you must all be familiar with. You must have seen some masonry units somewhere in your life in construction. It is a very common type of structural material, structural component that is used. Some basic information about myself, because you guys may not know me very well. You guys are in first year. Uh, so far, you have not taken any civil engineering courses. This is the first civil engineering course for you. Um, my office is in Academic Block C. This is old information. Um, my new office is in, please note down, I think in your lecture notes, you might have the new information. Academy blog B221. Okay. And uh, my email address is correct. And also my website information is slightly revised. But even with this link, you can reach my website. Um, most of the communication will be done through Google Classroom between you and I. And uh, the text uh, textbook for this course, there are two textbooks rather. One is Dayaratnam's book, Dr. Dayaratnam's book, that is brick and reinforced brick structures. And the other book that will be used more as a reference material because it is international book, internationally oriented book rather than only India oriented. Um, that is masonry structures, behavior and design, right? This one, masonry structures, behavior and design. All right. Um, then there are in this particular course, since this is basically a materials based course. In civil engineering, you will see that there are several Indian standard codes which are used as text material. Okay, so there are some of these commonly used codes: IS five four five four, IS one zero seven seven, and so on one nine zero five. Some of them will be used very frequently. Some of them will be used less frequently. But there are a number of codes which are going to be used, and I will be referring to them. All these codes are freely available. They are a book also. I have a hard copy of that one. It is out of print now. But you can get, uh, so you can basically photocopy that book from me. But unfortunately, we can't meet each other. Um, the library had a copy of this second book, Messenger Structures. So again, you can't access the library also. So we have to mostly rely, you have to mostly rely on my lecture notes, which should suffice for most part. And then these Indian standard codes are available for free on the internet. You just need to go to the BIS website. the Bureau of Indian Standards, BIS website, and you need to register there. Okay, and as you register, then you will have free access. To all Indian codes. Okay. Fine. So before we start discussion on masonry structures, um, I, I'll be also talking about various other construction materials very briefly. But uh, this is a common slide that I always love to show to my students. Um, these are some of the tallest buildings in the world, right? Now, can somebody identify some of these buildings? Let's discuss this in the chat box. So. Please, as soon as I go to the chat box, I think uh, you will stop seeing this slide. But the first one, the first building, can somebody answer what is the name of that building? What is the name of that building? Somebody is talking in the background, it's very noisy. Yeah. Uh, can somebody type the answer? What is the name of the first building in the chat box? No? Empire State Building. Very good. Yeah. So this is the first building, is Empire State Building. The second one.
What is the name of the second building? World Trade Center. Very good. Where is it? Where is the second building? It is not there anymore. Sorry. It used to be in the, in New York City. Both the first and the second building. They were both in New York City. Okay. How about the third building? Have you seen? Has anybody seen third building? Willis Tower, very good. Uh, so Willis Tower is known as Willis Tower now, about 10 years back or maybe less than that. It uh, used to be known as Sears Tower, Sears Tower. It is in Chicago. Okay. The fourth one, Malaysian Twin Tower. Yeah, but they have a name. Twin Towers, yeah, but Petronas Towers. Petronas, yes, very good. So the fourth one is the Petronas Tower, uh, Towers, uh, and the fifth one, fifth, Taipei 101, yeah, Taipei 101. Why is it called 101? Anybody? Why is this building called 101, Taipei 101? Yes, very good. Yes, yeah, so it has 101 floors. That's why it is called Taipei 101. Okay, and the last one, of course, everybody knows Burj Khalif, right? It was known as Burj Dubai first, but then it was sold to the Khalifa and then Khalif of uh, Dubai. And I think then it was renamed as Burj Dubai, Burj Khalif, sorry. Yeah, so now there is something common between all six buildings these six buildings they are all tall buildings of course but there is something peculiar about them there are many other tall buildings in the world there is something special about these buildings why i, I that's why i have listed these buildings here and not other tall buildings can anybody guess why okay they are all steel Construction material of all is same. Okay. Anybody else? Reinforced steel. What is reinforced steel? Can concrete, reinforced concrete. Okay. Anybody else? No. No, so it is not construction material is not common between the six of them. It is rather different. Some of them are steel, some of them are concrete. What is common between them is that each one of them has held the title of the tallest building for at least certain time. Okay, so the first one had held that title for a very long time, then second one for a very short time, then the third one, and so on. So these are the names and these are the durations for which they had held the title of the tallest building. So for example, there are taller buildings than Empire State Building in New York City now, but those buildings were never able to hold the title of the tallest building because the tallest, tallest building right now is in Burj Khalif, is in Dubai. So any building that is taller than Empire State Building now does not hold that title. So it is. So it is, these are not the six tallest buildings in the world now, but they have held the title of the tallest building at some point, each one of them. So you can see the timeline also 31 to 72, the first one, 72 to 74, 74 to 98, 98 to 23. So you can see that the first building, really, Empire State Building, held that title for a very long time, almost 41 years, right? And then, um, then even Petronas Towers held that title for four years only, right? I think Willis Tower also holds that held the title for quite a bit. So that is important part. Now, if you see that I have written them in two different colors, the first three are written in red, the second three, the last three are written in gray. Uh, what does that signify? Why am I grouping the first three in red and the last three in gray? You can again type and give the answer. Hmm. Yes. And the last three.
Okay, very good. Yeah, so basically the first three buildings here, the Empire State Building, the World Trade Center and the Willis Tower, they are all made of steel. Now, when I say made of steel, it does not mean that no other material is used. All it means is that main structural components are of made of are all made of steel. Whereas in the second, in, in the fourth, fifth, and sixth building, the main structural components are also made of concrete. There might be some steel, some structural steel also might have been used. For example, special features such as that that bridge between the two towers in the Petronas Tower. This one here. This one, right? This particular bridge and the structure supporting it. Those structures might be made of steel. I'm not saying that there is no steel used, but the main structural frame of the two towers that that is reinforced concrete. Okay, so the fourth, fifth, and sixth are made of concrete. Now there is one more difference, or there is one more categorization that you can think of. the The first three buildings they are all in the Western Hemisphere. They are all in the US, which is in the Western Hemisphere. The next three buildings, they are all in the Eastern Hemisphere, right? So, so this classification tells us two things. One, that uh, the trend in construction is seems to be moving from steel to concrete. The more and more ambitious buildings, tallest buildings, they are being built nowadays more in concrete than in steel. Okay, that is one. The other one, is that the taller buildings are being built more in the Eastern Hemisphere, that is your Dubai, Taiwan, China, right? And uh, Malaysia and so on, Singapore. And, uh, but earlier the tallest buildings were being built in America, that is Western Hemisphere. So that has been a major shift. And uh, now you can attribute this shift to economical development also because East has been developing very much more rapidly than the West in the last 30, 40 years. And some of this can be attributed to that. It is difficult to say, but even now, I mean, I've been following the development of a city like Hyderabad for the last six years. And I can see that steel as a construction material is again becoming popular. It wasn't as popular about six to 10 years back, but now it is picking up some popularity. There are advantages to steel, but there are some disadvantages to steel as well. Anyway, so this course is not steel, is not on steel or concrete. I just wanted to have some, so get you enthused about the construction materials that we use and how they compete how they compete against each other okay so there is a big lobby in any city in any country you will see there is a big lobby which advocates use of steel and then there will be another lobby that will be advocating use of concrete so concrete has some disadvantages then concrete people try to bring up some solutions which will address those disadvantages similarly steel people will also be working on the areas and constantly they will be working and sponsoring, sponsoring research in those areas where it has disadvantages but anyway in this course we are not talking about going to talk much about steel or concrete we will be focusing more on masonry right so before this steel and concrete became so popular there was only one construction material that was commonly used which was masonry now masonry in itself is not really a homogeneous material like steel or concrete even i mean it's wrong to say that concrete is also homogeneous in fact if you go to microscopic level even steel is not homogeneous but as far as uh, at macro level if you talk about at a level which where you take one foot like 300 mm by 300 mm by 300 mm size specimen then both steel and concrete start to behave very in a, like a very homogeneous material Okay, but masonry doesn't behave even at that scale. Masonry doesn't behave like a homogeneous material. It, it is still a very non-homogeneous material. It is a composite material. Okay, masonry time can be timed at the same time as timber. So masonry and timber were the com common choices, were the most popular choices of construction. Timber is basically wood, right? And then along so sometime along the way, bitumen came. Now bitumen is not used so much for building construction or bridge construction. It is used more for pavements and mixed with gravels and then FRP composites have picked up some part of the construction industry. They are more popular, FRP composites are more popular in mechanical engineering where they make cars, they make airplanes, jets, uh, turbines, whatever, like so many different things they make with FRPs. But in construction also, they have become quite a, quite popular nowadays, okay? So why am I saying masonry is a composite material? Um, of course, because masonry is made of two parts. Which two parts? Anybody wants to answer that question? Which two parts is masonry made of? Uh, 
I'm saying masonry is a composite material. When I say composite, that means it is a mix of two materials. Which are those two materials that it is mixed with? That is made of cement, Shashank. Uh, masonry is not made of cement. Okay. Uh, I, I understand what you are trying to say. You probably don't know the exact word. What are the, what else? You need you need to have two materials. Sand, limestone. Okay. Um, the first uh, the way I would classify it as first material would be brick. Now it could be any brick, or it could be brick of any material. Bricks rather, and second is mortar. Okay. So masonry has to be made of bricks and mortar. Only when you bring bricks and mortar together, you get masonry. You understand? So a brick can be called a masonry unit, but when you say masonry, you mean a combination of bricks and mortars. Now bricks could be made of various materials. Bricks could be, could be made of clay, they could be made of limestone, they could be made of granite stone or anything. And similarly, the mortar could be clay. In fact, clay is often used in villages, even now in villages, clay is used as a as a uh, joining material very frequently. Uh, sometimes they crush limestone uh, and they, they mix some other materials with it and they use that as a motor. Cement, cement sand mixture with water that is often used um, as motor. Okay, so motor could be made of various materials, some kind of adhesive paste, and that is motor. And bricks are basically the units which are which provide the volume, which provide the stability. And uh, you you cannot have a full wall made of brick size, right? Because if you I mean if you go for making a brick of that size as a wall then it will be difficult to transport it will crack while during the manufacturing and there also there will be so many issues so the bricks have to be of a limited size and then you need a material to join them together okay so you can use a clay paste or something bricks have been the material of choice from eternity from whenever you know i mean any recorded history or even before uh, before the recorded history also bricks have been used for construction they have been the they have been the material of choice so the oldest structures that we can think of are the pyramids of Egypt. Now, pyramid of Giza, as you might know, is the tallest. Is was the tallest structure for for almost two millennia, almost two thousand years, till nineteenth century. That is till nineteen hundred something, okay, or eighteen hundred something. Um, so. The tallest pyramid that is known as pyramid of, at Giza that is uh, measured as 147 meters tall. Um, can, does anybody have a reference to how tall is 147 meters? How does how tall that does it feel? You know 100 meter race, right? You know how far 100 meter is. 147 would be even uh, longer than that. Let's say one story is about three meters high. So you are talking about approximately. 45 or so meters story building. Okay. So about 2600 BC, they were able to build these structures, which were almost 45 story tall. How tall are the faculty towers in IIT campus? How many stories are there in faculty tower? Faculty and staff tower, anybody knows? Eighteen. very good. Yeah, so those are only 18 story tall. These are 40, 45 story tall. I think I don't think even now Hyderabad has any building which is 40 more than 40 story tall, 45 story tall, or maybe just about that high. Yeah. So you can imagine how tall they were able to go. And uh, there were some, I mean, you can watch a lot of documentaries on the in, on the internet about the Great Pyramids. Uh, they were the stones that they had used, since the structure was going to be this large, and this was not a building structure, this was more like a uh, dump of bricks. It was it had very little open space. There was some open space, there were corridors inside, there were walkways inside, but they were very small spaces. So they were not very worried about structural stability. Structural stability was a given, it was not a problem. So they had used really, really large size bricks. And average brick size was approximately two and a half ton. Do you know how much is two and a half ton? You have some reference for how big two and a half ton would be? Seven 
size wise anybody can answer that on, on the chat board let's say if i am saying two and a half ton brick how many meters by how many meters by how many meters typically no okay so maybe i can give you a clue brick density is approximately two and a half times water density so a brick of two and a half ton if i take the same size water bucket that water bucket would, would and fill it with water that bucket will weigh will weigh um, one ton so what would be the size of that brick it would be 1 meter by 1 meter by 1 meter approximately okay this is approximately 1 meter by 1 meter by 1 meter now you can imagine how heavy that brick would be a brick that is it's basically not a i mean you can call it a brick of course but it's basically a large stone that is cut from a quarry somewhere far far away from this location and it was carried from there to here and then erected in, in form of this great pyramid okay and some of the largest bricks so that is the average size of the brick but many of the bricks were even larger so some of the largest bricks were weighing approximately 15 tons how much does 15 ton weigh like uh, how much does a typical car let's say a i have a hyundai i10 i can talk about that one but any typical indian uh, not a sedan a small car how much would that Way. One point two, one point three tons. Correct. Yeah. So approximately one ton is roughly you can say one car weighs approximately one ton. Yeah. So how much effort it would take for us to move that car, even though the car comes with wheels, right? And these stones did not come with wheels. So they had to make some arrangements. They had to put them on some kind of a wooden logs, and uh, they used to push it and roll it forward. By putting them on a wooden on a series of wooden logs yeah but still you can imagine the wooden logs are not very smooth like our tires right and it would take a lot of effort to push this kind of 15 ton for example a brick of 15 tons size weight how hard it will be to push it upward to take it to the desired height yeah but they were in ingenious people they were able to accomplish these kind of things way way back okay another famous masonry structure that you all might have heard of is because basically if you refer to any old structure any structure that was built more than uh, three four hundred years ago all those structures by default will be brick structures those brick, brick material would change depending on which geometry which period you are talking about but they will all be brick structures masonry structures so the great wall of china again it is a huge structure it can be seen from famously said that this is the only structure that can be seen from the space man-made structure that can be seen from space um, they built it over a very long period they started building some parts of this wall for in 400 bc and generation after generation they kept uh, building some other parts and kept, kept expanding this wall till 1600s yeah so almost for 2000 years they kept building this wall in china yeah? and it was mostly built by Ming dynasty people and they have used different types of stones because the this wall was not built in a particular period it was built over a very long period so they and over a very long geometric stretch so whichever was the material that is locally available they use those materials so they use different types of timbers stones and bricks etc all right our own taj mahal even that even though it's not that old not old like the pyramid or the great wall but still this is also one of the major monuments very significant monuments and i'm sure you might have thought about it some, at some point what material it is made of so it is basically made of limestone and clay bricks so it does not use a single type of a brick clay bricks burn clay bricks so basically if you make a brick out of clay and burn it in a kiln then you get a kiln you are familiar with the word kiln right right So you put the brick in a kiln and you burn it for several days, several weeks at a very high temperature. After that, it solidifies 
and that brick or the limestone brick, uh, a combination of them is used inside this structure. And what you see from outside, that is marble, right? What you see, this white color facade on the surface, all of it, all of this, whatever you see here, and that is all. That is all marble, right? Marble is not the structural component. Marble, these are marble tiles. If you look at, look at them closely, you will see that they are of, of different sizes, like uh, very from uh, at location to location. But these are all tiles, which are glued on the surface. But in, in from inside, they are all masonry, which could be clay masonry or limestone masonry. Okay. One famous structure. Right. So this is a European structure. So I have given you one example from Africa, one example from Europe, one example from South Asia, India, and one example from Asia, rather, China. Okay, so this Starbucks, Starsburg Cathedral in France, that was built in 1439, but it, it was the tallest building structure, not the tallest structure, because Giza's pyramid was still the tallest structure in the world, but that was not a building. That was a structure which was basically a dump of bricks, uh, in a way. Not exactly dump, but they were organized, but it's basically solid bricks. This structure was meant to be a building. It had a lot of open space. It was meant to, it was a cathedral. It was supposed to be used for that purpose. Yeah. So it rises to a height of approximately 142 meters, which corresponds to approximately 40 meters. 40 story tall building. Yeah. So approximately the tallest buildings in Hyderabad, it matches them. And it was built in 1439. And it remained the tallest building for a very long time, till the 20th century. Yeah. Bricks can be used. Now, of course, we have seen the examples of bricks being used in different buildings. Right? They are used in a cathedral. You saw the example of bricks being used in a wall, in a building like Taj Mahal, very beautifully designed. Right. So and plus the pyramid of Giza. So for structural applications, in earlier times, brick was the only material. So they had to use all structural components out of bricks. So the most common that comes to our mind immediately are the gravity load bearing structures. So you may have what you can make out of bricks. You can make balls with bricks. So this is how a typical ball structure looks like. You have different configurations for placing the bricks inside a wall. You can make pillars or columns out of bricks. Yeah. So, for example, this is an example of a column supporting a slab. There is a slab which is supported on a column. This is a masonry column. And column would be looking like somewhat like this from inside. You would have two bricks going this way, and then in the subsequent layers, you will have different orientations for the bricks. And then you can also have balls made of bricks. So this is a masonry wall or brick clay brick wall. This one is a stone brick wall. Okay. Similarly, this is a clay brick column and this is a stone brick column. Yeah. So likewise, you can see a lot of examples. It depends on the geography. You go to a particular location, you are more likely to see clay bricks. So for example, the clay bricks of Northern India, the clay bricks in the uh, Midwest in the US, those are very good quality clay bricks and you can see a lot of bricks being used for structural applications. Uh, in South India, you don't see bricks, especially clay bricks being used for structural application. Here you are more likely to see stones being used or nowadays mostly cement blocks being used. Um, if you go to any hilly areas, for example, if you go to Uttarakhand, if you go to um, Northeast, Meghalaya and so on, you will see much more uh, Common, commonly, common application of these kind of walls and these kind of columns, which are made of stone, because stone is much more readily available. Clay is not. Okay. <coughs> bricks can be used as walls. They can be used as columns. Which was these two are obvious applications. But where the bricks start to have some difficulty, or masonry starts to have some difficulty, are the places where you have to span some distance. So beams, lintels, these are the locations where you start to have some problem. So what is a beam? You are all familiar what, with the term beam, right? So beam is a, maybe I can extend some drawing. 
so for example if i a beam typically is represented as if you have So if I have two supports, okay, and there is something I want to do between these two supports, but I don't, I want to keep this space open, all this space, I want to keep it open, I don't want to build anything here, and I may have this support here, and I may have some, some support available here, then whatever I do, there has to be some structural arrangement that I have to provide to span this space. Space and that arrangement would be called a beam, a slab, a lintel, or a sill sometimes, but mostly these. Okay. If it is a perfectly straight configuration, then it will be called a beam or a lintel. Sometimes we have to provide arches. I'll discuss about them. So the masonry of and this was a very very common requirement. Why was this common requirement? Because in any building that you want to make or any bridge that you want to make, of course, a bridge by definition is the structure that spans an open space. But uh, I don't like to delete this part. Delete uh, triangles. Sorry. Yeah. So if you have a building or any kind of structure. You are more you are very likely to require and some open space so for for us to be able to utilize that open space or the space above that open space you have to build a lintel so a lintel a lintel is basically if you have opening for a door Require a beam to support this slab. To support a slab. Okay. So these are the two common applications where we had to provide, find a way for necessarily to do that. Now, as you might have learned already. Whenever you use, whenever you have a beam, and then you have some supports here, and you apply some kind of a load on top of that beam, half of that beam is compression. Am I right? So if I look at this beam, half of this beam, half of this beam, I can divide this beam into two parts. Imagine that this is my beam. This is the cross section of the beam. If this is my beam and I divide it into two parts, then half of it, this half, oh, what is it doing? Again, let me try again.
if this is the cross section, the upper half will be in compression and the lower half will be in tension. Now the material that these bricks are made of, so for first of all, you cannot get, it's not very easy to get a brick of the size of the door. So if this is the door width or window width, width of the opening. So one of the option would be to, to get a stone of this size, right? Then there are two challenges. One, getting a stone of that size is not always that easy. Getting a stone of this width size is all, not that easy. And even if you get it, and if you apply a large amount of load, what would happen is that most of the brick materials, whether it is stone or whether it is clay brick, bricks no matter which material it is they are all very early in tension okay. so they cannot get very much large size stones so the cross section size has to be very large plus it's also always a challenge to find a single beam single stone that will span that kind of a length so your opening size will be limited. Let's say I want to make a room. So for that room, I have to, if I have a room and I want to cost, put a slab on top of it, the room needs to be 10 feet, 20 feet big. So for a room of 20 feet size, I have to find a way to span that length. Now finding a stone, a continuous homogeneous stone from a quarry, which is 20 feet wide, and plus it, it is large enough in cross section so that it can carry all that load, gravity load that is coming onto that slab is very very difficult it's not that easy and therefore this was a major limitation so the challenge here was that if you use this as a brick unit you will develop some tension cracks very easily and in order to avoid these tension cracks either you have to keep that span as small as possible or otherwise you have to increase the size of this brick that means the width the the width of the thickness and all those dimensions have to be increased so that this stone does not develop the, those cracks. Otherwise, this stone will break. Okay. Um, if you try to use two stones and use a joining material in between, that joining material is also very, very weak in tension. So if you use any kind of mortar, you can have the mortar made of clay or you can have it made of some kind of a, uh, some kind of cementitious paste, that will also be very, very weak. So none of those materials would be able to resist this tension strain tension stress okay and uh, as a result it will fail so this was if you look at some of the very very old structures some structures in india are said to be from mahabharat period so or even older so if you go to the mahabalipuram or any of those uh, or any of any of the temples which are from that period or not exactly that period but at least like you know more than 2000 years old or something like that you will see that this is what they have used they have used a very large stone sill on top of the door to keep the weight of the remaining structure so there must be more weight above that door but all that weight gets transferred to the neighboring to the supporting walls okay? so like you have two supporting walls here and you put a very big stone here to support the weight that is coming yeah but that also limited the size of the door so as a consequence you had a very you, you had some very beautiful temples all over india but if you notice the doors were always very small and this was the limitation because they could not find a single piece of stone that would be able to uh, span large gaps okay now then engineers were starting to work some solutions find some solutions to that one option was to go for some kind of a truss structure so that's where you get primitive arches so you can see some structures where some kind kind of arch were built okay but these were still very very uh, basic they were not very fancy structures what they figured was that instead of using a single brick to span a particular gap let's say this is gap is very large and the stone that i'm able to get is of this size 
the stone that I'm able to get is of this size. Now, with a single stone, I cannot span this distance. What I can do, however, is I can rotate this span. Rotate this stone. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. So if we rotate this stone and then we bring another stone of almost similar size and put it here. Another stone of a similar size and put it here. And then we put a lot of mass around here so that these two stones don't slide away. Then if we apply any load, on these two stones, they would be able to resist significant amount of load. Beautiful part about this configuration would be, what would be beautiful? That none of the components will be in tension ever. Why? What we can do is we can very easily check it with some free body diagrams, right? So if I have a stone, and then there is some load acting on top of it. There is another stone. What? How I can resist this load is first by applying a vertical reaction to that load. Right? That I will. I already had. I had these two supports. These two supports were available to provide that lateral, the vertical reaction. Now what will happen is that if only this much is provided, these two stones will slide out. They will slide and move back this way. Correct? But in order to prevent that, what we can do is we can provide some restraint here. So we can put a lot of we can provide a lot of mass okay on both sides fill it with some other material so that these bricks cannot slide out and if that can be prevented basically what we are doing is we are essentially we are providing a lateral constraint to the structure okay so if you look at the free body diagram of any one brick You have a load acting, let's say this total load is P, so you will have P by 2 acting here. You will have P by 2 acting here. The vertical forces will be balanced, but the horizontal forces, but the moments will not be balanced. So in order for you to balance the moments, what you can see is that you have to supply some force here and then some force here. And that depends on what angle you choose. If you choose this angle theta to be very small, then this force, let's say I will call it Px, Px. Then if this theta is small, that Px will be very large in comparison to P by 2. But if this theta is relatively something like 45 degrees, then Px will be same as P by 2. And that's how it can be managed very easily. The beautiful part is that if you look at the forces in this, in this brick, the forces are all compressive. The net force here will be in this direction and the net force here will be in this direction. So the brick is completely in compression. And that is the beautiful part about these kind of arches okay now again this was not a 100 percent solution one that the load is not only acting at this location right what i have assumed here in the previous example was that these are the two bricks and the load is acting here but you may have loads acting here and loads acting here the load is everywhere the wall is continuing so the the ball is all over the place if i can think of it so all these loads are acting right not only at this location so what will happen is again, because of these loads, because of this load, this was pure compression, but because of these loads, again, this member will undergo bending, flexure, which will mean tension and compression, correct? So again, we, we have 
delayed the problem, but we have not completely solved the problem that we were having. We wanted to avoid tension. We reduced the amount of tension we were developing, but still that tension still exists. Okay. So that's how primitive arches had come about. These were the primitive arches. The idea was that the weight, the weight of the brick and the weight of the wall above and any structure above it will be resisted by these two forces, W, W, R and R. Okay. But it solved some problems, but did not really solve all the problem. There was another type of structure which was called corbelled arches. So these are all arches, but they are not arches in true sense. The cor corbelled arches, if you look at this structure very carefully, this opening is shown, this window sort of a thing in, a, in some fort from the northern India. If you look at it, I'm trying to zoom into it. If you look at it, you will see that <clears throat> the bricks are going just like in any other place. But what is what is being done here is that some of the brick units, for example, in this area, they are larger in size and they are locked in from behind. So what happens is that at a time you are putting only a small part of any brick forward. For if you look at any brick that is ending at the gap, a small part is put projecting forward, but a larger part is resting behind. Similarly, for this brick, is this brick, a small part is projecting forward, but a larger portion of it is locked behind, which is held back by the rest of the weight. So this weight is holding this brick down and therefore the brick does not topple. If you look at this brick, this brick is, the weight of this brick is supported on this brick. But this brick, if this brick was not held by all these bricks, this brick would simply fall down. It will topple, right? But that doesn't happen because these are all locked by another layer of bricks at the top. So this was kind of an interlocking mechanism between the bricks that they had worked out and they were able to span more than two brick lengths. So here maximum they were able to go less than two brick lengths. Here they were able to go more than two brick lengths, but still that was not completely satisfactory. That's when they realized they can do they can make use of two arches. So these arches were the inventions of Romans or sometimes people claim that it was invented by uh, uh, some of the uh, empires in uh, Egypt or Persia. But most of the most beautiful oldest examples of these arches are, with, are available in the Roman, in the earlier Roman Empire. So most of the credit is given to Romans. Um, these were uh, invented in 1400 BC, long, long ago, right? And uh, these were used uh, in a large number in present Rome, many structures. So the, the structure that you see at the base, at the bottom of this slide, uh, that is known as, does anybody know what is the name of this structure? What are these structures called? Can somebody type? What are these called? Anybody? There were a couple of messages that I missed before they were typed. Uh, Sushank had asked me questions. What are those structures called? Those messenger structures? This messenger structure? What is this? What is that structure? Nobody. Huh? Okay. So these are called aqueduct. These are used to carry water from one part of the city or from, from one part, maybe a lake far away from the city to the city. So these are basically, there are channels, there are canals, small canals on top of that structure. This entire two, three story building, two, three story structure, tall structure is built to carry water. And there is a small canal or channel on top of this structure at various levels. And that brings water to that side. So there is a natural elevation difference. This is at a higher elevation, this side is at a lower elevation and it is used to bring water to that level. Because in those days, they did not know how to use pipes. So they were not able to make sealed pipes not like we can do now. So if we had to do that today, we would simply take a pipeline that would go down and then go back up. And we know that water will still flow up 
first down and then up right inside the pipe but the these people did not know how to make sealed pipe joints so or at that large scale how to make sealed pipe joints so they were not able to carry that water in using pipes they were using water they were carrying this water using in open channel flow sort of a thing so even if it was some of these were pipes also but they were open channel flow they were not completely pressurized flow and as a consequence uh, they had to constantly have a uh, downward flow of water right water would flow only downward so and they they uh, accomplished that and these structures were built uh, approximately 600 bc to 600 ad or 300 ad in that era okay so but arches were known even much 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 before that yeah so what are arches arches are these kind of parabolic structure and not necessarily parabolic sometimes they are they have different definition of curves sometimes you may have semi circular sometimes you may have more like a hyperbolic curve yeah so these kind of structures were used to transfer the load yeah and arches were found to be very effective as i was discussing here instead of a straight line so instead of going with a horizontal member if we turn into a triangle we could see that the bending moment effect was reduced similarly if you turn it into a number of small triangles so instead of a straight line we turn it into a triangle and that reduces the amount of bending moment we could also turn it into a small number of triangles more number of triangles right and a perfect shape would be and that will basically reduce the amount of bending moment and a perfect shape would be a parabola so if we can convert into a, into a parabola and then apply a uniformly distributed load what you will end up with is only pure compression throughout the length of the member rather you would not even have this right you will only have pure compressive forces to resist the entire gravity load okay uh, i had solved some examples here i am not going to spend too much time explaining about this how the arches work you can go through it later so i think i should stop here i have covered quite a bit of material today um so arches were a huge invention and they completely changed the Uh, the way structural engineering was being done so after the arches were invented and domes are basically a three dimensional version of arches so in any mughal era architecture if you see um, you will see in, in uh, older hindu temples you will see triangular structures right you will see that the 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 main this uh, thing that is called garbhagriha right so that is the main center of the building and that has a kind of a triangular peak it is not so much curved but if you see any mughal architecture or anything that came around it after i think in india mostly structures before 8 900 ad they have this triangular shape and all the structure many structures that came after that period especially during the mughal era they all have these curved domes right so these curved domes were very very powerful tools Uh, there were special engineers who used to define how to define how, who, who used to define the shape of the dome and then there were techniques through which they could put all these bits slowly step wise and later on when they remove the support from underneath the the entire structure would um, get into an interlocking and will not fall yeah so there are a lot of beautiful videos available about how the arches and how the domes are made um, in real life um, i encourage you to watch them these are beautiful structures um how, why don't we see as many domes or arches nowadays can somebody answer that question <clears throat> can somebody try to answer see uh, in the mughal era and in the period before we used to see triangular structures we used to see curved structures but nowadays all our buildings you see they have flat slabs right the slabs are completely flat the lintels are flat we don't have arches at the location of the lintel right and above a door we don't have a curved shape we have a flat slab shape so why 
are we able to do it now you you have seen several like you know our dining hall for example in iit very good so yes yeah, arthak has given the right answer so for example our dining hall if you see you can you can see the amount of space open space it has similarly we are building a lecture hall complex similarly if you go to academic block b the ground floor there is so much of open space and that is all has been accomplished by use of steel so the 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 period that i'm talking about the taj mahal period and the mughal era period or even the period before steel was not used in construction people had not figured out how to use steel as reinforcement because steel is very good in tension but in carrying in resisting tension but in in the period that i am talking about when the masonry was used more frequently um, steel was not used with it in the interim from about 1800 something to 1900 something um, there was a common type of concrete which was known as brick concrete wherein they had they used to use brick units along with steel it was it used to be called reinforced brick concrete there are three four comments i'll i'll get to them in a minute so reinforced brick was also a common type of structural element wherein they used to use masonry along with steel rebars steel bars right uh, in concrete now it is that what we use is concrete which is basically a combination of sand cement aggregates aggregates is basically pebbles the large size stones okay and water of course so they are mixed together that is concrete and then in addition to that you put a layer of steel and what that steel does is wherever concrete is weak in tension steel provides that uh, helps resisting tension with the era that i'm talking about in that era there was this steel was not in use they did not probably make or maybe steel was very expensive and it was not affordable it was not wise to use steel in construction i mean they were learning how to make good quality steel for swords and all so it must have been very expensive and uh, nobody would have thought of using it for construction okay now there are two comments here because steel can withstand tension very good masonry isn't as much in use nowadays masonry is not your right masonry is not as much in use for structural applications for non structural applications masonry is still used quite a bit okay sarthak uh, is saying domes require large surface area domes have large surface area i agree the disadvantages of domes is there is a major major disadvantage of dome structure which you don't have that disadvantage you don't have if you have a flat slab anybody wants to guess why what is the major disadvantage with the dome structure and in a flat if you can make the slab flat there is a major advantage with that no tougher to maintain mm that is i mean I, i agree i mean of course it would be difficult to access that area which is curved but uh, major advantage is see you have already built a structure you have already put the slab so why not use that slab so in a dome you cannot use that dome right dome dome has a curved structure high speed wind no 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 see, those things come much later <laughs> nobody was even in those days nobody was even worried about wind speed they did not know how to design for lateral loads uh, or at least they didn't engineer for lateral load um the major it, it's very basic advantage if you have a flat slab you can use that space so in all our homes anybody who has a single story house at home in the home town or something in cities it's very difficult but in smaller towns single story two story houses are very common and whenever you have a two story house the the terrace is very effectively used right but if the terrace is curved or slow even so for example the places where it rains a lot or where it snows a lot people keep a sloped curve sloped roof and then they are not able to use that space that terrace cannot be used right similarly if you have a dome then you cannot use that space above the dome so that space goes unused okay so that was the major advantage with flat slab and that's why flat slab became very very popular unless it is required because there is a snow so for example if there is lot of snow in your area then it is better to go for a sloped roof 
but then you lose out on that space that can be utilized. Okay. Um, I would recommend you to go through this particular slide where the free body diagram of a hinged arch. This is called a hinged arch. Arch. There are three hinges here, one, two, and three, or three hinged arch. I would recommend you to go through this slide and try to understand why an arch does not require any bending moment resistance, bending moment capacity. Maybe I'll spend some time in the next class to explain this thing. Uh, with this, I think I can stop today. Um, uh, anybody else, if you have any questions, you can unmute your mic and ask them questions if you want. before we start today's discussion. Anybody? No? Okay. Maybe I'll give you one minute. Okay. All right. So, well, uh, I think the class went all right. The, other than there was some initial hiccup, the class went okay. Uh, I'm going to, I have, I have been recording this class. So I'll try to share this video with you. We'll see how it goes. Okay. All right. Thank you guys. Thank you.